Editor-in-Chief of Sky and Telescope. And in case you weren't here two days ago for the welcome, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Sky and Telescope and Travel Press uh, to this great Eclipse Cruise on the Symphonia. Today we're going to prepare you for the Eclipse itself. A series of two talks, myself first on observing the Eclipse, and then Alan Dyer after me on photographing the Eclipse. This will be the only time when we ask you to sit through two back-to-back -back presentations. Since they're so closely linked and since a lot of the questions that we anticipate getting uh, might be addressed best to one or the other of us, uh, we decided to do it back-to-back. -back. There will be a break between. And then on subsequent days when we're at sea and doing lectures, you'll generally have one in the morning and then a different one in the afternoon from a different speaker. Okay, so today's the only day we plan to try your patience. I like to talk about experiencing the eclipse rather than just observing it or watching it. Because I think that a, a total solar eclipse is really a, a complete mind-body experience. Kind of like uh, watching a birth or something like that. It's so emotional and it involves so much more than just seeing. It involves hearing and your other senses as well. So I want to try to prepare you for what to expect and the kinds of things that you'll see and hear and feel so that you have a bit of a game plan in your head, especially if you're a first timer. A nice quote that reflects this sense that there's something very, very special about a total eclipse is from Jay Pasikoff, who's an astronomer at Williams College in Massachusetts and who has seen probably more eclipses than just about anybody on the planet. He is a solar astronomer. Seeing a partial eclipse and saying that you've seen an eclipse is like standing outside an opera house and saying that you've seen the opera. In both cases, you've missed the main event. Almost everybody in the world has seen a partial eclipse. They're relatively frequent, and you don't have to be in any particular place, really. They, wherever a partial eclipse happens, it covers a large swath of the planet. To see a total eclipse, though, you have to be in a particular place at a particular time, because the dark central core of the moon's shadow travels across a very narrow track. So far fewer people have seen a total eclipse, maybe one in 10,000. And it's a very, very special experience. Much of what will be contained in my talk and also in Alan Dyer's is at least summarized in some sense uh, in the source book that you should have all received. Uh, if you haven't read the sections on, on what to expect and, and how to take pictures on Eclipse Day, I do encourage you to do that before next Wednesday. Though I think between what I say and what Alan says, uh, you'll get most of what you need to know. Depends how serious you are about, about uh, trying to see everything. I'd like to begin by just giving a very quick overview of graduate level celestial mechanics. Uh, that's what you need to understand why these things happen. Um, I'll try to compress uh, PhD in celestial mechanics down into three or four slides. Um, this comes from a, you know, a, a fifth year graduate level text. And it basically, the caption says, moon blocks sun go dark. Okay? As long as you can remember that, very simple phrase, you, you understand what you're getting yourself into. Okay? Now if we want to go a little bit deeper, just a little bit deeper, let's look at a few key aspects of this diagram. It's drawn from an Earth perspective, because that's where we're going to be observing. The moon goes in orbit around the Earth. The sun appears to go in orbit around the Earth, but of course that's just the reflex of what's really happening, which is the Earth going around the sun. But the important thing is that each, each of them follows a path in the sky. It's a great circle. And those two great circles cross at two points. Those are called the nodes. And if the sun and the moon happen to cross the node approximately at the same place, the moon will block part of the sun, or if, they're, if they cross right at the node, it will block the sun completely. The most significant aspect of this illustration is not the orbits and the tilts. It's the fact that the moon and the sun appear to be nearly exactly the same size. It's that cosmic coincidence that permits us to have the glorious total solar eclipses that we do see where the solar outer atmosphere, the corona, becomes visible. 
if the moon were much bigger or much closer, it would completely block out the entire sun and the corona. And we would see it get dark, but we wouldn't see anything particularly pretty in the sky. If the moon were a little smaller or a little farther away, it would never completely block the sun. We would see partial eclipses, but we would never get to see the corona, and we might not even know it exists. Now, because of the tilt, because of the fact that the moon's orbit is tilted about five degrees with respect to the sun's apparent orbit, there are different, there are different ways that the, uh, that the crash can happen. If the, if the two objects reach the same parts of their orbits when they're far enough away so that their diameters don't touch, the moon just sails past the sun, no eclipse happens, and that's what happens basically every new moon, except every now and then, typically twice a year, when this collision happens closer to the node, and the moon either nicks the sun or covers it completely. I think this next slide shows the situation in the three forms that it can occur. If the moon is very, very directly positioned between the Earth and the sun, it will have a total eclipse where it goes right behind the sun, the moon's shadow touches the Earth, and in that spot, and along a track that it crosses the Earth, you'll see a total eclipse. If the moon passes above the sun, as seen from Earth, the shadow misses the Earth, and you see only a partial eclipse where the moon just nicks the sun. Because the moon's orbit is elliptical, it gets carried farther away and closer as it circles the Earth. And its, its match in size to the sun is so finely tuned, if you will, that sometimes it is a little bigger than the sun, we get a total eclipse. Sometimes it's a little smaller than the sun, and we get what's called an annular eclipse, where the sun does go right in front of, or the moon goes right in front of the sun, but it doesn't completely blot it out. What's causing the moon's size to vary is, is of course, its, uh, its distance. When the moon is closest to Earth, it appears larger in the sky, and it therefore, in particular, it appears larger than the sun. When it's farther from the Earth, it appears a little smaller in angular size, and it doesn't cover the sun completely. The Earth has an elliptical orbit around the sun, too, but the variation in the size of the sun is much smaller than the variation in the size of the Earth. But this photograph shows very vividly how much the moon's angular size changes. These are two pictures taken when the moon is closest to Earth and farthest away, and it shows you that the diameter varies by quite a significant fraction. So when it's closer and bigger, it has a better chance of covering the sun. Well, the central dark core of the, Earth's, of the moon's shadow, the part where the entire sun is blocked, follows this narrow track up through Africa and across the Mediterranean into Turkey and into Asia. And we'll be observing the eclipse right in here in the Libyan desert. But as you'll see, virtually the entire continent of Africa, all of the Middle East and Europe, much of Asia, the far north, they will see a partial solar eclipse. For them, part of the sun will be blocked, but not all of it. It's only those of us who are lucky enough to be in this path that will get to see totality. This is a spacecraft view, a uh, weather satellite, I think, um, showing the march of the moon's shadow across Earth. Here it is in the first frame. Here it is in the second frame. Here it is in the third frame. So you can see it marching across like this. This is the uh, August 1999 eclipse over Europe. And you see that the shadow is very, very dark at its core, and it occupies a pretty small region. And you have to be in that narrow region, typically no more than about 100 miles wide, in order to see the total eclipse. All right, that's it for the celestial mechanics. Now we'll get into actually how to observe this thing and how to enjoy it. A partial eclipse of the sun is, if you're gonna look at it, you have to have some kind of special protection because even when the sun is partially blocked, whatever parts are not blocked are as bright as the sun. I mean, you're looking at directly at the sun. So the only way you can look at a partial eclipse directly is with a proper solar filter. 
we distributed these little equip shades. Everybody should have them. These are for naked eye observing of the eclipse during the partial phases. During totality, you don't want to wear these because the, the uh, entire visible surface of the sun is covered, and at that point, you're looking at something that's only about as bright as the full moon, so you don't need any protection. But when any part of the sun is still uncovered, you definitely need the glasses. You can put them on over glasses if you have glasses. You don't need to take off your, your regular eyeglasses. There's a couple of lines, a couple of scores, and you can just fold it along whichever ones make it fit well and put them on and look at the sun completely safe. But you can still go wrong. For example, if you look up at the sun and put the glasses on, that will somewhat defeat the purpose because you will have already blinded yourself for, for a few seconds. What you should do is face the sun, and it'll be pretty high up toward the south, face the sun, then put the glasses on, and then look up. And then after you've had a good gander, not much changes over a, a minute or so, you just look down and take them off. If you have plans to observe through binoculars or a telescope, you absolutely have to have some kind of special filter to go over the front. You must never do what I'm about to show you. You must never put your glasses on. I need three hands. Never put your glasses on and then look through binoculars. Okay? That is the wrong way because you're going to get unfiltered sunlight into the binoculars. It's going to come out the other end as a very powerful magnifying glass, and you've watched it burn a leaf, or maybe an ant if you were a mean little boy. And it's going to do that to your eyeball. Similarly, these, these are not anything that you want to put over the front of optics if it's not going to completely cover it. Okay? You really should use a special filter made for the purpose such as the ones that are pictured on the screen and also that I have here. These go securely over the front, and then you can safely observe. And you can look up at the sun to your heart's content, assuming that you can find it because you've got a pretty narrow field of view and you tend to kind of do a little of this, and then you take a little peek, you know, like that. Only for the partial phases. Partial phases before totality and after. During totality, off go the filters. In the dark, and it will be dark, be careful where you put them down. It's safe to look at totality with binoculars or a telescope, but you need to be aware of when it's about to end because you don't want to be looking through when the sun's visible face reappears. Okay, so I've gone over how to use the glasses. By the way, what I showed you with the binoculars, the same applies for looking through a telescope. If the guy next to you has a nice telescope and you want to sneak a peek through it, make sure it has a filter on the front and ask if you can do it. Don't just peek in with your filter, I mean with your glasses. This is actually kind of a funny slide because you would not leave your filter on during totality. But in any case, the point is just that filters go over the front, okay, the front of optics. Okay, so now that we're prepared, we have our equipment, and we're out in the desert, what are we going to see? If you, hold, if you hold any filter up over the sun during the partial phases, you'll see the crescent. You can, this is pretty much what you'll see with your eclipse shades, just a little yellow crescent. I think these, these glasses give a little orange crescent. If you look through binoculars or a telescope, you'll see a highly magnified view. If there are sunspots, you'll see those. It's a lot of fun to watch the moon creep up on the sunspots and blot them out. I didn't get a chance to look through any of the scopes that were set up at lunchtime, but I heard earlier this morning that there's really not much going on on the sun right now. Uh, so it may look fairly featureless like this. There's other fun ways to observe the partial phases. On the South Pacific Eclipse Cruise last year, there was a nice potted palm on the deck. And the palm fronds, because they're, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, little spaces between the leaves, cast these little uh, pinhole projections of the crescent eclipsed sun. 
You can bring out a spaghetti colander if you travel with one. Uh, you, can take, you can take a card and punch a bunch of little holes in it to spell out the date or your name or anything you want and hold it up to, with the sun at your back and, and see the little crescents projected on the floor. If you didn't bring anything, and I can promise you there are no palm trees in the, in the part of the desert we're going to, or trees of any kind, you can just take your fingers like that and just hold them up to the sun and you'll see a nice little pattern of crescents on the ground. Because the partial phases happen before and after totality, you get two chances to look at this kind of stuff. If you forget at the beginning, you can do it at the end. It takes about an hour and a quarter from first contact when the moon takes its first nick out of the sun till totality. And for most of that hour and a quarter, it's just like watching grass grow. It's very slow, there's not much happening, you know, it's just, you know something's happening, but it's just taken a long time. Sadly, all the really great stuff happens in a real hurry. And it happens so fast, and there's so many things to look at, that I can absolutely guarantee you, you will not see everything. And that's probably the main reason why people keep going to eclipses, because they miss things. No matter how long the eclipse technically lasts, it feels like it's over in eight seconds. And there's just too many things to see. So I'm gonna spread it out and show you the eclipse over a much longer time frame so you can sort of get a sense of what it is to be looking for. Then if you're lucky, you'll see most of it. And if you don't see most of it, you'll come back in a couple of years and see another one. As the crescent gets very, very thin, and as it begins to get noticeably dark, there's a strange phenomenon that often appears called shadow bands. It's a combination of the very, very thin crescent and atmospheric turbulence, which acts in a way like a, like a funny lens, and it creates these waves of alternating dark and light stripes. You can see them on the ground if you lay out a towel or a sheet. You can see them on the side of a building. This is a, an exaggeration in this old engraving. They never look that distinct. They're very subtle and they move. It's kind of almost like the aurora, if you've ever seen the aurora, you get these wavy patterns going through. We'll be out in the desert with a brown, a brown flat surface, so it'd probably be a good idea if you're interested in looking for these things, maybe bring one of the towels from your room or uh, put out a, a large white sheet or a scarf or something on the ground, weigh it down with rocks so it doesn't blow away. And in the last few minutes of the partial phases before totality or in the first few minutes after totality, you can look at this thing and see if you see these waves, these shadow bands. It will get dark. Exactly how dark, it's hard to say. It's a combination of what kind of corona we have, how much dust is in the atmosphere, uh, whether the wind is blowing, things like that. The sun's altitude has an effect. It's gonna be very high for us. This graph, which is from an eclipse a few years back, shows that the illumination dropped by a factor of about a thousand. That's consistent with the notion that the eclipsed sun is about as bright as the full moon. But it's not concentrated in that little disk. It's spread out over a much wider area. So the actual corona that you will see is not as bright as the full moon. But it gets dark at midday. And because it's dark, the stars and planets come out. If you're not familiar with this kind of diagram, it's showing the whole sky up at the time of totality. Just pay attention to the bottom part. This is the southern horizon. You'll notice that the sun at totality will be almost directly on the noontime meridian. It'll be about 65 degrees up, and about 45 degrees to its lower right will be the planet Venus, very, very bright. You will have no trouble seeing Venus. We'll probably see it several minutes before totality. If you remember that Mercury's there too, it's a lot fainter, about 100 times fainter. If you remember that it's gonna be there too and you look for it, you'll probably see it. It'll be about two-fifths of the way between Venus and the Sun. How many people here have never seen the planet Mercury? Never seen the planet Mercury? I mean, many astronomers have never seen the planet Mercury because it never strays very far from the Sun. So it's not like you can go out in the evening at two hours after sunset and look up and expect to see it. It's set a long time ago. 
Similarly, if you go to look for it in the morning sky, it doesn't rise until the sun comes up, and so you basically just can't see it. You have to know when to look and where to look. But the first time I ever saw Mercury was during the solar eclipse of 1998. It's hard to believe. I mean, I've been in astronomy for three decades by that point, but I had never, never taken the trouble to find it, and then it just popped right out during a solar eclipse. We have about four minutes of totality, so it's okay, you have my permission, to, to look away from the sun for a few seconds, okay? <laughs> Last year in the South Pacific, I, I did not give my permission because the totality lasted 30 seconds and I thought it was foolish to look away from a 30 second eclipse to try to find planets and bright stars. But after you've had you know, a minute or two and you've started to really soak it in, take a second to look around, look at the horizon, look for the planets, especially the ones that are in the same general direction as the sun. If you want to see Mars, you'll have to turn around and face the northeast. If you want to see the bright star Vega from the Summer Triangle, you'll have to turn around and look to the northwest. If you want to see Orion in broad daylight, it'll be rising in the east. And as I'll show you in a few minutes, we have a flat horizon all the way around. So it's an interesting challenge to see how far you can see in broad daylight. Thousands of light years, potentially. The other reason to look around is that the shadow, as I mentioned, is about 100 miles wide. And before the eclipse becomes total, 10 or 15 minutes beforehand, you'll begin to notice in the west, southwest, the direction from which the shadow is coming, that, that the horizon is darkening. And what you're seeing is the moon's shadow is, is touching down farther southwest of us, further down into Libya, but it's rushing our way. When it finally gets here, we'll be standing in the middle of it, but areas 50 miles in every direction will still be in daylight. And so you look around, you'll be standing in the dark, but the horizon all the way around will still be illuminated. And depending again on how much dust is in the air, how high the sun is, things like that, you can get really nice sunset colors, pinks and peaches, uh, in the desert, we're more likely to get muted colors because of the suspended sand and dust in the air. But in any case, it will look like sunset all the way around. So it's definitely worth looking around you during totality. This is a picture taken at the 2005 eclipse last summer, sorry, last year, uh, by Miloslav Druckmuller, who's on board with us uh, on this cruise and will be taking pictures. Um, Here's Venus. It was very close to the sun. You know, the sun is a half a degree across. This is just a few degrees away. Next Wednesday, this Venus is going to be 45 degrees away. So instead of looking up and seeing it right next to the sun, you're going to have to go like this to see it. But it's unmistakable. It's so bright. Once the partial phases are on the verge of ending, there will be only the thinnest sliver of the sun is still visible. And then that sliver will start to break up into pieces. The reason for that is that the moon's edge has mountains and craters and valleys on it. And so as the fit of the moon is becoming perfect on the sun, the mountains start to blot out parts of the edge of the sun, while the valleys are still letting the sunlight through. So we get this little string of pearls that's referred to as Bailey's beads. And here's a bright one, a faint one, and a couple of bright ones all burned out together. When there's only one left, the last little bit of sunlight shining through the deepest valley on the edge of the moon that's encroaching on the sun, at that point, you can begin to detect the corona on the other side of the sun, and you're, you see this beautiful, what's called a diamond ring diamond ring effect. It happens at the very beginning of totality, just as the last bit of sun disappears, and it happens again at the end of totality, just as the first bit of sun reappears. So you get to see two. Most people, though, will be lucky to see one, because you have to have your solar filter on while there's still sunlight visible, because it's so intensely bright, even if it's just one speck. So you tend to be 
watching, and just as you feel that the last bit is getting sucked into the abyss, you'll yank off your filter, you'll be able to detect some corona around the other side, and then it becomes total. But now you're looking with your, uh, you're looking with your naked eye, or you're looking without your filters, um, and maybe you're taking pictures, you watch the eclipse progress, and then depending on what you're doing, you may or may not be looking at the exact moment when the last, uh, the last second of the eclipse occurs and the, and the first bead forms. But in my experience, most people see the one at the end more often than the one at the beginning, because at the beginning they often still have their filters on, and they don't take them off until the sun essentially disappears. But at the end, most people are, are looking, hoping that totality will last another 10 or 15 minutes, and then all of a sudden, out pops a bead, and they immediately put their filters on, but at least they saw the diamond ring. How many of you remember, remember, uh, remember to bring a diffraction grating? Anybody? Is, it, is that, you really did? Okay, you and me, you and me. In the first program this morning, nobody else had brought one. As the sun gets completely covered up, that is, as the sun's photosphere or visible surface gets completely covered up, the, the only thing remaining between the edge of the moon and the corona is this very, very thin layer of hot gas called the chromosphere. That's the bright red region from which you see little prominences sticking out <coughs> during totality. When you look at a spectrum of the sun, you're looking at absorption of sunlight by gases in the atmosphere, and so you see little dark notches in the spectrum. But when the photosphere is covered and the chromosphere is visible only, those lines turn into emission lines, bright little images of the crescent in the spectrum. And that's what you're seeing here. These are lines from hydrogen and helium and sodium and things like that. If you're looking at a, at a spectrum in a diffraction grating, just as the eclipse goes total, you will see the spectrum go from a nice continuous band of color to this little collection of discrete atomic lines. It's fascinating. Um, I only did it on my very first eclipse, which was a six-minute eclipse, because I knew I had plenty of time to look at things. Um, and I've, I think I'm going to do it this time, uh, but I may end up not doing it. But it's fun, because it's a phenomenon that you can only see during a total eclipse, and it only lasts a fraction of a second. It's called the flash spectrum, because it flashes into view. And then finally, finally, after an hour and a quarter, totality. Though that whole sequence that I just explained is all happening in the last 10 minutes or so before. In totality, the entire visible surface of the moon is covered by, or the sun is covered by the moon, and the beautiful, ethereal, pearly white corona is visible. Very few photographs capture what it really looks like. This photograph makes it look really bright, and it is bright, but in a in a strange, subdued, electrical kind of way, as opposed to uh, luminous like a, like a star or a planet in a telescope. It's really very, very beautiful, and I'll explain some of the strange structures that you're seeing a little bit later. No matter how long it lasts, it feels like it's over in eight seconds. So in order to spread it out a little bit, I'm gonna show you uh, a sequence that Miloslav took last year showing you from second contact, beginning of totality, to third contact, end of totality, in several steps. We were in the Southern Hemisphere, so in contrast to what you'll see next week, the moon moved down and to the right across the sun. In the Northern Hemisphere, the moon moves from the lower right to the upper left. So keep in mind that the moon is moving down. It's just about to cover the last bit of sunlight, and this is the diamond ring. Then it's gone. Now we have totality, and you'll see there's a few little prominences sticking up, little bright spots. In, to the naked eye, they're a brilliant magenta, striking color. As totality is about to end, it starts to brighten on the side away from which the moon is moving. Then you get another Bailey's, or you get another diamond ring. That's when you're going to put your filters back on because this 
string of Bailey's beads is going to come out and it's going to be overwhelmingly brilliant. And totality is over. And just as you had at the beginning, you have a flash spectrum. And then the whole sequence of partial phases takes another hour and a quarter to unfold. And everything that you might have missed the first time, you have a second chance to look for. Shadow bands, to play the little game with the projection of the, the uh, crescents on the ground, and so on. Let me back up and show you the sequence again, just because it's, it's fun. It's fun to watch it step by step. I'll go a little faster, and you, you'll, you will physically see the moon moving down and covering and uncovering the sun. It takes a lot of photographic talent, as Alan Dyer will explain, to get a sequence of pictures of that many pictures of totality in a 30-second eclipse. This is the timetable that we published in the source book. A few people this morning told me that they're not convinced that it's right. Well, if it's off, it's off by only a minute or two. Uh, I'm going to look into it. Uh, I don't think it's wrong, but uh, it only matters to the accuracy of a few minutes if you're actually going to program your camera or your computer to take pictures automatically. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter. The gist of it, the most important thing, is that the eclipse will be total afternoon with the sun high in the south, and it will last about four minutes. Sorry. Yeah, four minutes of totality. But the whole thing takes almost three hours. All right, I want to show you a couple of animations to prepare you for what it's actually going to look like in the sky in terms of the way that the moon is moving across the sun. For this, I have to get out of PowerPoint for a minute and switch to QuickTime. <coughs> the first movie I'm going to show you, these come from Starry Night, which is a planetarium program, shows you as if you were out in space, not bound to the surface of the Earth, and we're watching the eclipse happen from the frame of reference of the stars. So the moon is moving in a straight path across the sun. I've sped this up a hundred times, so totality will take very little time. Here again, you see the moon's moving from lower right to upper left, covering up the sunspots, and then at the very end it gets really exciting and then it's over. Okay, now that's not quite what it's going to look like for us. Oops, I closed one more. Let me reopen that. <coughs> We're going to be seeing it from the ground, and the first part of the eclipse, the partial phases leading up to totality, will be in the morning sky, and the sun will culminate at the zenith, and then it will tip over into the afternoon sky. So from our perspective on the ground in Libya, the sun will appear to rotate, and the path that the moon is taking will appear to curve. So first contact will appear at about 3.30 or 4 o'clock position on the disk. And then the moon will begin to move up and to the left so that the diamond ring at the beginning of totality will appear at about the 10 o'clock position and then at about the 4 or 5 o'clock position for the last diamond ring. And if you stick it out to the bitter end till about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, fourth contact will appear up near the very top of the sun. Now the problem with this version of the animation is that you can kind of make out the moon. When you're looking through a filter, you can't. You only see the sun. So this view, which sort of simulates the view in a hydrogen alpha telescope, shows a little bit more realistic idea of how the eclipse progresses. The moon comes out of nowhere and just starts progressively eating more and more of the disk of the sun. And then you get ready for the big show, you whip off your filter, you quickly put it back on, and go home. And you try your best to remember what happened in that four minutes intervening. All right? So, 
a lot of people try to be the first one to pick up first contact. You know, who sees it first? It'll be somebody who's looking in a telescope and watching at that four o'clock position. They'll see the first nick come out of the sun. Then people who are observing with binoculars will notice. And then finally, enough of it will have progressed that people with the naked eye will be able to tell too. All right. Okay, I said at the beginning that observing a total eclipse of the sun is, is not just an observation. It's not just what you see. It's what you hear and what you feel too. If you were here a couple days ago for the first talk, you will have already seen the video clip that I'm going to show you. Um, it's really more of an illustrated audio clip, uh, but it will, it will give you a sense of, of the auditory experience of totality. 30 seconds. Removing video filter. 25 seconds. There's the corona. I see bees. Oh, I see baby bees. Oh, I see the corona of my dog. Look at that. Uh-huh. Look at eyes in the flash spectrum. I see the scientist who's doing the video is busy taking pictures. Fabulous! He hasn't Fabulous. actually looked at the eclipse. Check out the video. He's just looking in the viewfinder. Oh Check out the video. Oh, the video is super. Let's pull back on the video a little bit. Pull back. Naked eye. Oh my god, look at the streamers! <laughs> desert in a small group of a thousand people. All the noise you just heard came from three supposedly grown men, two of whom, including the guy who shot the video, had already seen many, many eclipses. So you can imagine, you know, what it must be like if, if experienced people can react like that. And there's no question that the sound will be terrific. Um, even if you don't videotape the eclipse itself. It's great just to have the camera running to capture the audio. Now, in addition to sight and sound, you can feel the eclipse. You can feel it because the temperature drops. You think about it, you're going from broad daylight, noontime desert sun, to the equivalent of sunset in 20 minutes time. The temperature drops very much as if you've gone from noon to sunset. Depending on the altitude of the sun, the moisture content of the air, the local topography, the temperature change could be fairly mild, it could be a little bit more noticeable. Often you will not quite be aware of it until you hear somebody say, ooh, it's getting cold, isn't it? You feel the breeze on your bare arms if you don't have your arms covered. Here, uh, I think this is 1974, guy recorded a, uh, you know, a pretty significant drop, almost 10 degrees Celsius, which is like 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, in my experience, most of the eclipses I've seen have been on the water, which moderates the temperature change quite a bit. So I've, I've seen recorded three, four, five degrees, but uh, it could be something like this out in the desert. So you actually do feel the eclipse. I'm, I was trying hard to figure out if, I, if we really use all our senses. Um, I'm not sure we use every last one, but, but we can taste the eclipse. Okay, we can taste the eclipse. <laughs> if we come prepared. If we come prepared. If you don't like gum, it also comes as mints. Okay? There's another way to taste the eclipse. 
what caused me to realize this was that I thought back to my first eclipse experience back in 1991 in Mexico. We were watching the eclipse from the beach, and most of us had a Corona beer in our hand, because that was obviously the appropriate eclipse drink, a Corona beer. This comes in especially handy if you get clouded out. <laughs> All right, I mentioned that I would describe a little bit more about those spikes and streamers and things that you saw in the sun. The little magenta prominences and the beautiful white corona have all these loops and streamers and spikes, and they change from, well, you can't see them change too much during the eclipse, but if you uh, have the right kind of telescope or if you observe the sun regularly or if you see multiple eclipses, you recognize that it these are continually changing. All of these shapes are controlled by the sun's magnetic activity. And the shapes become more familiar if you think about a simple bar magnet and iron filings, because you get the same kinds of loops and whirls caused by the magnetic field lines. At the poles, they tend to be uh, curved spikes, and at the equator, they tend to be loopy. The sun is magnetic in many different ways throughout its structure, and at different wavelengths of light, you see different aspects of the magnetic phenomenon. The most familiar one in visible light is simply sunspots. But the corona that we see is also visible uh, to the naked eye during the eclipse. In x-rays and ultraviolet light, uh, we see different layers of the sun, different uh, temperature regimes in its atmosphere, and other structures become visible as well. Here's a comparison of an extreme ultraviolet image and a white light image of the same little piece of the sun. This is what it looks like in familiar light. You can see views like this through the telescopes on deck if there are sunspots. And this shows the incredibly intricate magnetic structures, these loops and arcs that are emanating from and falling back into the sunspots. And what's, what you're seeing, all of these structures are ionized gas, the sun is very, very hot, ionized gas that's entrained by the magnetic field and flows along the field lines. This is a close-up of the chromosphere, this thin arc here. This is the part that's responsible for the flash spectrum. And these prominences are the kinds of things that you see sticking up over the limb of the sun during totality. And again, you see these magnetic structures. You get little loops and arcs and spikes and fountains, and they're all showing you what the shape of the local magnetic field is on the sun. This is a close-up from space of one of these prominences. And it's just, it's amazing. What's, what's even more amazing is to go to the website where I grabbed this picture and look at some of the animations, the way these things evolve and change over just time scales of minutes. If you actually have an H-alpha telescope, like some of the Coronado scopes that you've seen here, uh, you can watch these kinds of phenomena, though not in this kind of detail. You can watch them change over five or 10 minutes. It's really fascinating. And just to put the whole thing in perspective, on the same scale as the sun, here's the Earth, right down there, all right? Any structure that you see on the sun with your naked eye is bigger than the Earth. So if you can see a sunspot when you just have your shades on, that sunspot is bigger than the Earth. If you see prominences with your naked eye, each of those, suns, each of those prominences is bigger than the Earth. In addition to being magnetic, the sun's the sun actually has a magnetic cycle where it alternates between more activity and less activity over an 11 year period. It's a 22 year period if you also take into account the fact that the polarity of the magnetism changes every 11 years. This is a picture in x-rays of the sun from maximum through minimum back to maximum over an 11 year period. And here's the same diagram with magnetic polarities indicated, where you have light for north poles and dark for south poles. And each of these regions has sunspots and prominences and things like that happening above them. And you'll see that the difference between the sun during solar maximum and during solar minimum is quite dramatic. Now, this has an effect on the corona, as I'll explain in a minute. Just recently, a month or so ago, 
some astronomers published a paper in which they believe that they've figured out what, what processes inside the sun control the sunspot cycle. They've got a very good match between the actual sunspot area over the last 10 cycles or so and what they calculate using their model. And they're predicting that the next solar maximum will be the second strongest in over a century. So we could be in for a lot of sunspots if their model is correct. And within the next 10 years, we'll know if their model is correct. Here's a higher resolution view of the situation we're in right now. In 2006, we're in solar minimum. That's one of the reasons why you don't see too many sunspots right now. The sun's activity cycle is at its ebb. But over the next few years, it'll build up again. And by the time of the six and a half minute eclipse in 2009, and the eclipse in the South Pacific again in 2010, the sun should be very, very active. Now you shouldn't think that an inactive sun means a boring eclipse. It's not that at all. It just means that the magnetic phenomena are at their weakest point, but, it, but their weakest point is still plenty strong. The main thing that the solar cycle controls is the shape, from our perspective as eclipse viewers, is the shape of the corona. If you see a sunspot minimum corona, which we should expect because we're at sunspot minimum, it tends to be elongated. This is the, the north pole of the sun and the south pole, and you get these equatorial streamers. During solar maximum, when the entire sun is covered with sunspots and flares and prominences, then you see a more round corona. At least that's what you expect. It doesn't always work out that way because we're talking here about averages. But on a daily basis, the sun can act up. And so as it turned out, my first eclipse, July 1991, turned out to be uh, an unexpected corona. It was sunspot maximum, yet the sun looked more like this, more long equatorial streamers, which is why Fred Espinak, the guy who shot that video, became a screamer, because he was seeing totally unexpected corona after the, the much experience that he had had. Let's talk a little bit about where we're going. Okay, We know we're going out into the Luvian Desert. The exact spot is right here along this road from Tobruk where the ship will dock toward the hot spot of Al Jakbub, which I know you've all heard of. It's a swinging place. <laughs> and there's lots of traffic on this road, I'm sure. Anyway, we're going to be right here on the center line, or just off the center line, uh, pulling off the side of the road. And it doesn't look like much. Okay. It's the middle of the desert, and there ain't nothing there, except what MSC Cruises puts there for our comfort chairs, toilets, shade, water, etc. I have a video that Aram Caprielian, the president of TravelQuest, shot a year ago. He and Jay Anderson, the uh, renowned eclipse meteorologist, came to the Middle East to, to uh, check out all the eclipse sites that our tours would be at. And they came the last week of March so that they could see conditions very much as we expect them next week. So here's that video. Okay, center line, south of Tubrook. That's a wind line. Here. The west. The road heading past beyond Tubrook, further still this into the desert. This is blue haze on the horizon. So we go from this side in the morning. Rocks, but plenty of You have of to say something when you record out video. here. This is for eclipse viewing outside of Tubrook. All right. So there's not much there, but at least you know what to expect. Now, how are we going to get there? We're not going to get there in an eclipse. <laughs> We're not going to get there in an eclipse. 
We are going to get there in buses, and tomorrow morning, the Travel Quest reps and the Sky and Tell reps are meeting with the Shore Excursion reps to work out all the logistics. So don't ask me too much about logistics because I don't really know yet. All I know is the ship is as committed as this ship can be to anything to getting everybody to the Eclipse camp well before the start of first contact. All right? Buses. I, now, to my knowledge, the word bus in English does not translate into the word for camel in Arabic. But because I don't know Arabic, I, I can't say that with conviction. I hope that that's the case. So what are our prospects for success? They're actually quite good. I showed you this slide two days ago if you were in the welcome talk. We're going to be in a region where the prospects for clear skies, in the sense of cloud-free skies, are 60 to 70 percent, which is very, very, very good. The percentages drop off rapidly once you get off the coast. Our group in Turkey has a less than 50 percent chance of clear skies. That's still reasonably good, but I'd rather have 60 to 70. As with the solar uh, magnetic cycle, you expect certain behavior based on the averages over time. The same is true with these eclipse weather predictions. Climatology is what you expect. The 18-year average at this time of year tells you what to expect. But what you get is the weather of the day. And we don't know that yet, but we're going to keep an eye on it. As of this moment, there's no reason for concern. Everything looks good. We're going to start looking at it much more rigorously over the next few days now that we're within the time frame, a few days, of getting reliable forecasts. Although I live in Boston, and there is no such thing as a reliable <laughs> forecast. The one unknown, the one thing different this time than on any of my previous eclipses is the possibility of a dust storm, a sandstorm. These can crop up any time. You heard the wind in the video. Now the eclipse site that we're at does not have a lot of, of thick sand. You saw that it was kind of rocky. It looked almost like it had been stripped. It's much more of a problem further east toward Egypt. We shouldn't have too much trouble, at least with local blowing sand. But the problem is that the Sahara is a big desert. And when you get sand blowing up, it circulates all over the place. And you can see, here's our eclipse site right under this cloud. But because the sun's going to be so high, and because the sun is wicked bright, and because the sand, although in this picture looks very, very thick, it really, it's not like, you know, it's not like choking smoke, there's a good chance that even if we do have a lot of wind-blown sand and dust, we'll still see a beautiful eclipse. We'll certainly see the partial phases just fine, and I've seen two eclipses through clouds at sea, and as long as the clouds were thin, you could see the corona, and you could see the prominences and everything else. Maybe you don't see the far extended reaches of the corona, but you don't go away unhappy. This picture was taken about a month ago. The more recent pictures show nothing, but you never know. There could be a big sandstorm two days from now. Let's hope not, but don't panic if you hear that there's sand. Now, why are we so lucky, aside from being on this beautiful ship, visiting all these beautiful ports, and seeing all these great antiquities? We're lucky because at some time in the future, solar, total solar eclipses will no longer happen. This is an established fact. It's understood. The tidal interactions between the Earth and the Moon are causing the Earth's spin to slow. That's why we have leap seconds, like the one that was added on December 31st just this past year. It's to keep our clocks in sync with the slowing rotation of the Earth. And to conserve angular momentum, if the Earth spin slows, the moon speeds up and moves out. You remember at the beginning I told you about the, the very nice balance between the size of the moon and the size of the sun. It's almost a miracle that right now the moon, which is 1 400th the size of the sun, is 1 400th as far away as well, but it's moving farther out. And as it moves farther out, about an inch a year, it gets smaller and smaller. And about a billion years from now. I know, I know, it's sad. You're going to really have to make sure you don't miss an eclipse between now and then. About a billion years from now, if there are sentient beings, beings on this planet, after all, I know they will be sentient beings, 
uh, they will not see total eclipses. The best they can get is an annular. So we're very, very lucky because we live at a time when we have this amazing cosmic coincidence that gives us these gorgeous total eclipses. Now after you've seen a few solar eclipses, you start seeing them everywhere, you know? <laughs> when we were boarding the ship, I said to my wife, Susan, look, the logo of the cruise line is a solar eclipse. She said, no, it's not, you idiot. It's a compass rose and a porthole. <laughs> I've seen more eclipses than she has. I defy you to deny that that looks like a solar eclipse. All right? And with that, I will take questions. Thank you very much. Before I take my first question, let me just remind you, we're going to break in a minute. We'll go out, have some coffee or a drink, come back in a half hour for Alan Dyer's presentation on Eclipse Imaging.